Hello there. This is the third one in the series. Let's see if I can get that there. The third um, uh, video on uh, horary astrology. Um, but this particular chart um, interestingly moves on even beyond horary astrology. And uh, we find that it, what turns out to be uh, what was originally a, an individual question about if we are leaving on the uh, 31st of October, are we, are we Brexiting on that date? Um, it turns out it to be a much broader question. And as I stated in the last video, I always look towards the chart to try and guide me, to tell me whether this should go ahead and what type of chart it is and so on. Because it's when the symbols represent, not only represent the question, but seem to be telling you something uh, beyond it, that there's also something to look for here. And it isn't so much a, a, a matter of yes or no, um, although that might be the final outcome. Uh, what we're looking for here is the something to do with the reasons behind this tension at the moment and to arrive hopefully at a possible resolution of the matter, which means to look for the best situation. What is, what is really going on underneath this? And this is really what astrology is about to try and find a, a method of guidance through this uh, chaos of madness that we find ourselves in in the last few years, since 2016. This is not to say that what we find ourselves in is wrong. There are a great many forces at work in this question, and uh, we can't hope to look in, into all of them through a mere horror chart. There are uh, international forces, uh, political forces, which seek an integrated union, which inevitably means a losing eventually of one's sovereignty, one's national identity, and moving into uh, what I've called a conglomerate superstate. Now that needn't be a bad thing. Perhaps the uh, the uh, forefathers of this. Um, movement, the uh, pan-European movement stemming right from the early 20th century. Maybe they're right about wars and maybe this is a point in evolution where we need to move towards a much more open society. But for those at the border, for those losing things, this is a uh, massive loss. It's the loss of a whole way of life and that also the loss of a, it would mean the loss of a national way of life. And I believe this chart shows something deep within um, the English nature as, as shown right from the 1066 chart because the connections between it and that. But in my pausings and in my musings on this, I realized that we're in a different situation now. We're not just about Englishness. This is about English and Irishness. This is about Irish and Welsh and Scottishness. In other words, Great Britain or the United Kingdom. Uh, um, um, and and what, what, what are those treaties about? What are those hard fought um, um, uh, connectivities between nations? We have Scotland, for example, a, a big movement wanting to leave um, England, but somehow join a, um, a, 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 an even more con uh, um, uh, um, uh, an affiliation with 28 other countries. Ireland has the same idea, it wants to leave England, uh, but, uh, but, but join this conglomeration. Uh, it doesn't see any trouble with that. And so perhaps the Welsh too somewhere do, do somewhere, but I have a feeling here that this has a lot to do with the underpinnings of the of Englishness of England and the way that it imposed its its um, its its power and its kingdom and its rule from the centre of the monarchy and I think that underneath this, it has something to do with a, a tension or a change about in that fundamental structure. Anyway, I'm what I've done is I've prepared here a small. Uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I want to bring up now. Uh, here is the, obviously, the question. Uh, I put the time up there, the uh, place and, uh, uh, and uh, the date, so that anybody may want to want to repeat this or look at this may do so in their own time. 
It is a strange question because it can't really be influenced by a single individual from the collective, maybe a single individuals in the political collective, but that's a condensed bunch of people. It must be remembered that we had a, um, we had a, a, a referendum not so long ago, now which was 52% of the country said we wanted to leave and 48% wanted to remain. This is hardly a conclusive evidence that the whole of the nation wants to move forward. But um, nevertheless, there was a substantial majority, over a million people, and that has been found to be undermined over the last uh, couple of years. There's been all kinds of questions about it. But I, for one, had a look at the um, had a look at what David Cameron said about the election. Uh, we had a look at the politics of it, and there were fors and against. And um, in conclusion, uh, David Cameron at the initial said, this is a once in a lifetime um, uh, choice. In other words, when I read the leaflet, it was clear that we would either leave or not leave. Didn't mention about a deal, didn't mention about anything else. Now, the deal that Theresa May had, I've covered, with, I've covered in other videos, that deal was rejected four times, maybe even five times, if you consider the fact that she went through it just before Christmas. So uh, it could have been four times, but nevertheless, it was rejected. And it's got something to do with the backstop, which means that because England is an island, it doesn't have a border connection with Europe particularly, but in Northern Ireland, it does. And so it's this contention, this bone of contention along this ancient border of difficulty between Ireland and England or uh, England and Northern Ireland. This is the problem or at least it's been the cause of a tension or problem, uh, perhaps with some kind of computer uh, stuff, or I, 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 I'm to some extent ignorant of uh, political matters, so I can't go into it uh, in too deeply, but I don't see why they just can't keep the same arrangements and keep the border open. But that's my naivety showing through. Let's move on to the orrery here. Uh, here we go. Is it a legitimate question? Well, uh, when any orary astrologer receives a question, he needs to move or he or she needs to move this through this list. No frivolous questions. In other words, questions of testing orary astrologers or um, uh, stupid questions like where's my pencil or, um, you know, uh, th things like that. Uh, you need to not ask that because orary is a serious divinatory manner matter. Sincerity, is the questioner sincere in what they ask for? Does it have a, a sense of earnestness around, around the question? Is it asked because of a, a, a need of the client to, to have, some, ha, have it answered? Now, if it's something else, has the, if, it, if the person is trying to find out through orrery something they can find out in other ways, then they also need to try those methods first. You know, you don't go to an honorary astrologer to try and find something in your house before you've had a look around the house first. The other thing that I say to uh, my students in honorary classes at the LSA is that this is not a case of, this is not a, a private astral snooping detective agency where you can ask up on what's happening uh, with, with your neighbours or asking uh, questions in which can, can be considered astral snooping. This is not about that. Neither is it about the self-aggrandizement -aggrand, uh, of the astrologer. If the person is looking for fame and fortune by utilising the horoscopic, the astral uh, intelligences for their own good, this is really um, the wrong way around. Because horary astrology is divination. And when you call upon the, the gods or the astrological intelligences to try and help you, they're not just going to um, uh, come down and say, yes, let's loan you our powers of vision and uh, let's, let, let's loan you those kind of things so that you can make a fast buck out of it. Or, for that matter, achieve fame. Some astrologers have achieved fame and uh, great reputation, but astrology, once it's debased through that, um, through that filter of, of, of the ego trying to get above its own station, it is then that it all goes wrong. In other words, don't be impertinent. 
don't be impertinent to the um, the great uh, qualities of astrology and the spirit behind it, spirit of uh, inquiry and the spirit of a uh, kind of guidance uh, or the requiring guidance from uh, some massive intelligence uh, beyond our usual ken. These are the legitimate questions. And when my friend asked me this question, there was no uh, doubt about it. This wasn't for uh, a particular fame, although I think the, the chart does say, suggests why they may have asked it. Let's move on to the, the next part of the process. Are there any indications that show we should not be judging the chart? Well, um, having gone through the list of questions and determining the question, is it a question for horary, then we should look to the chart. In other words, are there any cautions or strictures, as they sometimes call? Are there any considerations that we must have a look at before we move further into the astrological interrogation, as they used to be called? Now, in order to find out whether this is possible, we need to see whether the chart does reveal the question as well as describe the questioner. This is the beginnings of radicality or the beginnings of the attunement to the chart so that we can, we can have this, this connection. And as soon as we start seeing this connection with our ast astrological eye and with our imagination, then we know that Kairos, has moved that person or that intelligence that I spoke about in the preambles, something, a force of nature or uh, some person attuning or something working through them at that time to turn it into an orary question and a case for astrological divination. If the answer is yes to this, then the chart is, doesn't say, no, you can't see it. Um, then we must proceed to the location of the significators in other words, the person asking the question and what they're asking about in order to see what the chart has to say. And it's a thorough examination, a thorough um, a, a look and, a, and communication with these significators should find you uh, uh, moving in to the next part, which would be the uh, outcome of the question that we seek. Let's move on now to the actual chart. And it's here that uh, we begin to see that curious uh, business of mystery and, and Kairos taking place. Now, nobody is to know this except myself, but the uh, question of themselves, uh, Capricorn at 8 Capricorn, uh, Jupiter is at uh, 13 Capricorn, Saturn is at 18 Capricorn in this person's chart, and they have a Sagittarian ascendant. Now, it is interesting that eight, uh, 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 we can see here that nine Capricorn 54 rises on the ascendant. So this person's natal sun is uh, uh, within uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a degree and a bit of this ascendant. So it describes him quite well, quite Saturnian, a little bit of stare, uh, older, considerably um, uh, uh, cautious in himself, uh, perhaps a, a, a person who is studious, hardworking, things like that. Uh, perhaps at the moment, because Saturn is retrograde in this chart, perhaps a bit sullen, perhaps a bit depressed, and maybe asking the question for another reason other than just to know. And I see here one of the great cautions against judgment is, um, is Mercury retrograde. But I won't say great caution, it's a caution to be noted because when you get Mercury like this in any question, it's a cosmic sign that there's something else at work, another question behind the scenes perhaps. What, what is this person doing, or wanting to find this out? Well, I think this Mercury retrograde tells us actually, because you can see here it rules the fifth house and I would hedge my bets that the fifth house ruling speculation, sometimes elections, interestingly enough, um, but the it rules speculation and gambling and things like that. And I suspect this person wants to know in order to try and put something down at the bookies. 
Anyway, that's my thought about it. And this Mercury retrograde, as I say, well, something underneath the question, something isn't quite shown. And uh, it's over here. So there's a caution there that there may be more to this than meets the eye up front. Retrograde, there are two discussions going on. You have what's going on at the surface, but there's a counterpoint of something. It's like those people that ask something, but they're really they're asking something else. And I, I presume that is the case in this case. Perhaps this person is somewhat ill at the moment, uh, maybe, or uh, needs money for a specific purpose. I'm unsure. But nevertheless, we begin to see a focus in, a, um, a, a, a beginning of a determination of the question. Will we Brexit on the 31st of October? Well, if I was to see this major caution, which, I'm, which is about Saturn retrograde in the first house, conjunction the ascendant and conjunction the south node here, which is supposed to be malefic in our astrology, it would be a big no. Saturn represents a boundary, a stop sign, a caution. Um, is this said to destroy the question? Uh, and it, uh, maybe even the answer uh, does not help the questioner in some way because something about it goes corrupt or it is used for a reason other than it should be. Um, but in this case, um, because Saturn is the ruler of the ascendant, he becomes the significator. And so this rule is usually waived. There is another rule, which is again counteractive here. If there is a significant part of the natal chart of the querent that is, that is shown on this chart, especially on the ascendant or a significator, then again, we can waive those rules of restriction and caution. We need to pay attention that this is a very serious matter and that Saturn needs to go very steadily one by one and through the architecture of orary astrology in order to arrive at a conclusive judgment. But the retrogradation here suggests that there is a, again, something behind the scenes, uh, maybe a, another intelligence working through. Because the person can't alter or do anything uh, uh, about the uh, Brexit, then as I say, this alteration of the, uh, this underlying um, motivation is not seen immediately on the surface because Mercury here is in Cancer, which is a, called a mute sign or a sign without a voice. So this Saturn here is a caution that we should move slowly. Um, but I have lined up various other things here because in my, um, in my attempt to try and find some sense from this chart and move through with some conviction, we first, I first had to work out for myself whether indeed this chart is radical. And I find that it is. And if it is, it suggests that it can be read. Now, why do I say this? Well, clearly, the question is about uh, the United Kingdom. But it's also a question of, uh, to do with, with England itself and its relationship with Europe. It's clearly stated. And the interesting thing about this chart is that the 9 Capricorn 52 is only two minutes away from the UK, uh, the um, 1066 chart of William the Conqueror, which we've explored in other videos. Now, I'd like to move on to that to show you the connections. And there are very odd connections too. We see here that the chart, uh, the uh, sun sign of, my, of the querent who asked the question, is virtually the same as the MC of England's chart. So in some way he has a, a funnel in, a, 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 his life essence, his life force, uh, which, is, which is Capricorn, seems to have a, a, an individual connection with the nation of, uh, uh, in some way. This is to do uh, with who's in charge, it's to do with the political party in charge, the monarch, all of that kind of stuff. But you see here, the sun is at 9 Capricorn 54, and here we have 9 Capricorn 52. Now this kind of coincidence needs to be um, uh, really considered because it's what I'm calling tangential tantrum. And these are the 
extra connections that a chart often points to in order to confirm its radicality. I often look at other charts in relation to the arteries. A lot of astrologers don't, uh, our astrologers don't bother, and sometimes I don't bother either, because to complicate the matter too much is to, is to overload. And if there's any one rule I first read in Mark Edmund Jones' book on honorary astrology in 1980, it was this. He called it the principle of Occam's razor. Don't multiply the complexity of your of of the um of, of the judgment. In other words, all the symbols can point to loads of other things, and you can get terribly confused. And indeed, I have. But tangential tantra here is is these side shoots it's the tangent to the main thing the tangent to the circle and yet tantra is a word meaning threads it's it's how things thread together in a mysterious form i took this um idea actually from a 20th century occultist kenneth grant and he used this to describe various um strange occurrences after a uh, 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 potent rituals well, if orary astrology is a potent ritual, perhaps this will lead to some tangential tantra. But it's the threads of symbolism which seem to connect to other charts, other times in history, other people. And there are a lot of curious ones. But the first one we can see is the sun of this chart is the same as the ascendant. This chart has to do with a kind of ch a channeled version of, of the main essence of England. Now, note that this is the English chart, and it's not to do with the European Union or Great Britain uh, or, um, uh, sorry, the uh, UK, United Kingdom, or the Union of Scotland and Ireland. It's a different nation now with those. But I feel this chart underneath, this is uh, something to do with the assertion of the British national identity. And has and, and and it's that that seems to impinge itself uh, uh, across the other forces which want to merge, which want to progress. We see in this chart a very positive Jupiter up here in the in the eleventh house. Jupiter is the planet of progress in many ways, of moving ahead. It's the great expectations of the public. And here we see that a, a, a great deal it has to do with where we are going in the future. This Jupiter is a, a wants to know what is happening up ahead. It, it seeks enlargement, it seeks fulfillment of itself. And uh, whether this is in a union or outside of the union, this question is uppermost in this, in this chart. But what else do we see? What else are uh, tangents here? Well, clearly, this Saturn at 16, 24 Capricorn is conjunction the nations or the uh, English nation uh, 16 Capricorn 36. We've covered this in other videos. But does this chart, does this person, the individual that originally asked the question, uh, are they voicing a question on behalf of the nation? Mercury in a nation chart is the is the voice of the nation it's how they say things it's their thoughts it's their the way they articulate things it's the media and the news it's the uh, a sense of uh, ability to create language and a, a, a and to express that if you like as part of the national identity Mercury is conjunction and the sun, so the nation has been extremely inventive. It's education, uh, um, stream of education has been long, and uh, it's, as I say, its inventiveness has been uh, quite, quite fortuitous, not only to it, but to the world also. So this sun conjunction, Mercury here, Mercury conjoins the Saturn, is the querent of this charm, actually voicing something in the nation uh, but it's something to do with the nation of englishness as depicted by the fact that this is the 1066 chart of england after the invasion of france uh, or uh, norman conquest um, of the norman conquest so it 
picks up a very ancient problem here that England was, as I say, uh, created, although uh, I think it took about 200, what was it, 200 years, 150 years before the English did not really accept that monarch and then proceeded along its own course, eventually towards, of course, Henry VIII, who then uh, made the, or introduced the idea of national sovereignty and the king is the head of that uh, sovereignty and so that it could create its own laws. Now, its own laws and its own way forward, as opposed to the uh, impositions from the Church of Rome. We again, we trace this uh, in, an, in, a, in another uh, video about Uranus in the ninth house in Sagittarius going its own way uh, uh, in terms of religion or the uh, uh, religion of its own choosing. Capricorn in general is a a self self sufficient nation it seeks its its own self determination win or lose it wants to do it on its own it's a uh, it's a structure inherent in its own self sufficiency and its own capacity capacity to regulate and control its own self this is this principle coming out with this sun in Capricorn. Yes, it seeks empire. Yes, it, 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 it's, it, it sought through its abilities to be the person on top. No longer is it such a, a great global power as it once was in the, uh, particularly in the industrial revolution and uh, in, in the fields of science. It no longer has that. But nevertheless, it contains a pride, this sun in Capricorn. And it's this pride that is being brought out and brought out into the open through this Saturn. So what I believe here is just in this uh, section alone that we see a connection between this person's individual voice and the voice of the, na of the, uh, of the nation in terms of England. So we have Capricorn in the individual. That person voices a question but it turns out to be a question on the mind of everyone else in the nation. Some may not want to hear a specific answer, but nevertheless, I believe that therefore, this chart has turned from being the chart of an individual question to a question on behalf of a nation. It becomes a great question and therefore should proceed as such. Now in the other videos, I will continue this analysis and uh, uh, go forward into showing other charts uh, that have a connection by tangential tantra to this one. For now, cheerio.